Welcome to Focus on the Fun Stuff podcast with me, your host, Emma Mills. Today, I'm chatting to Mike Jones. He's the founder of Better Happy. And we're talking about the importance of crafting a business strategy and mission that aligns with both your personal fulfillment and financial goals. And today we delve into how we get your team healthy, happy, and aligned with those business goals. We explore how to create a motivated team culture and the common pitfalls business owners face when their leadership style might clash with their employees' perspectives. In Mike's transformative journey, we cover his burnout, navigating price increases in his first business, and his transition from military life to traveling and finding himself through to entrepreneurship and starting several businesses. This episode is packed with literally practical advice, personal stories, and things you can go and implement, take away, and get done. So tune in, get inspired, and let's focus on the fun stuff in business. Mike, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm really excited about today because I think it is definitely going to be one of those ep- episodes that is super relatable to lots of uh, lots of the listen- listeners. Um, I'm going to ask you to to introduce yourself a little bit, but I just want to like I know that you are a you're an you're an award winning author, mm-hmm. um, you're a leadership coach, and I understand that your ethos you think that businesses can be a win win for everyone, the business owner and the people in the business by yeah. great systems, great culture. And that's what your business now, Better Happy, is all about. And yep. um, we met on, I think we met originally on the ski trip, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Which sounds quite bougie, actually. I thought we that. met on a ski yeah. trip. But <laughs> I, I, I thought about this conversation in my head and I thought, we, we're going to say we don't know each other that well, really. And then we're going to mention that we've been on holiday together twice. Twice, that's yeah. Like, that's really weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but when when I've been on these, like, because it's a trip for business owners, ultimately, yeah. wasn't it? We met via um, Key Person of Influence, yep. Daniel Priestley's program. Um, and you just don't get to speak to everybody in depth on the trip, do you? But I no. just knew that uh, we've, we've worked together a little bit since. And I just know that we've got a really good connection on my passion of understanding, like, how do you get to focus on the fun stuff in your business? How do you stop it from being all consuming, all overwhelming? And I know that what you're focusing on now very much addresses that. So it's yeah. perfect for this podcast. Um, and the other thing that I just think is really, really like real about you, Mike, is that your methodologies, your theories, the business you have now is all based on real experience. Yeah. It's not like theory or you've trained to be a coach or like you've lived and breathed having a business that burn you out, yeah. having a business that's successful and you're happy in. Um, so we're going to delve into all of that stuff. Yes, we- um, maybe if we take it back a little bit that you, because I guess I kind of got that it was like th- so far three parts to your journey. There's like the military. Yeah. There is then not enjoying it, go and find yourself, this, yep. um, the gym and and better happy now. And maybe if we just yeah. started with that earlier portion of the journey. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think it's probably more four phases because it was the unfulfilled at work phase, which I think a lot of people find themselves in at some point in their mm-hmm. life. So for me, that was the military. You know, I did the military for five years, did a couple of tours of Afghanistan. You know, I, I would never change it. I learned a lot from it, but I got to a point where I was like, this isn't what I want, you know? And actually the reason I joined the military was to get out of my hometown. That really? Was, yeah. It wasn't because I was passionate about being a soldier or, you know, I wanted to go and fight in Afghanistan. It was nothing like that. It was a kind of uh, what I call a negative goal. It was to get away from not being happy in my home life. And then when I left that, uh, I can't, can't remember the exact year, but I know it was not long after recession. So it's kind of like the, the, the retention strategy for the army was to scare people out of leaving by saying there's no jobs. <laughs> so um, I was like, oh, okay. Um, so uh, I, I, I basically went in very cliche. I put a backpack on and did just under three years of traveling. Uh, so I had like a spiritual phase. And then that was really transformational for me. I read a few books that changed my kind of philosophy for life. A mm-hmm. uh, big one was The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. So that made me kind of see an Eastern philosophy of life which is very different to the western philosophy of life um and that kind of set me on a different path because i was probably wasn't in a great place before that i was a bit of a binge drinker Mm -hmm. um i got myself in trouble now and again Mm -hmm. um uh, yeah so and i I was stuck in that i was stuck in that behavior and i disliked myself for it and i think a lot of people that have ever struggled with drugs or drink they they will be able to relate to that you know you're yeah you're doing something you know isn't good for you doing something that you know isn't getting you towards um, where you want to get in life and isn't aligned to who you are as a person, but you're still doing it anyway. Yeah. So I got stuck there for a few years and I think it's because I was unhappy. So reading this spirituality and looking at the different ways of living actually helped me fix that. So I was like, wow, okay. And when I got this new philosophy, I basically stopped drinking 
within a period of months, like completely. Something that I'd struggled with for, wow. for, for probably since I was about 17, which I'm not proud to say. Um, yeah. So then uh, that made me, that set me on the, uh, that this, this new philosophy then set me on the path of being a better person, be, making good use of my life, trying to do things to help others. Uh, and then I came back to the UK and I thought, well, how am I going to do that? And um, I don't know if it's because I've done five years in the army and I just didn't want to have a boss anymore, any discipline. Um enforced on me but yeah i decided to start my own business so then i had a that's stage three uh, which is business ownership but uh-huh. i was not very sensible at, about how i approached that business okay and basically i i mean it was a good business like when i say not sensible i don't mean i was like spending all the money or anything like that yeah. it, was a, it was a good business it doubled in size every year it was profitable we grew a team it started from nothing so it's a good it's a good success story but along with this business growing and doing really well and building a team and helping people change their lives I was making myself get more and more miserable and stressed and burnt out. Okay. So I hit this burnout phase and that coincided quite neatly, if you look thinking about it now, with um, COVID. Oh, right. Okay. So like 2020, this happened. Yeah. At 2020, going into 2021, it kind of all happened at the same time. I was like rock bottom, depression, really hating the business mm-hmm. and um, and hating myself because I wasn't being the motivated, driven person that I wanted to be. So it's a vicious cycle stuck in my own head. And then COVID came along and I was like, do I want to try and fix myself, pull this business through through COVID, which which was a possibility. Um, but basically, I, with coaching, actually, I decided that that wasn't the right option for me, that it was a bit of a sign to maybe close the business and uh-huh. focus my effort on the new thing, which wasn't immediate, but it was better happy, the business that I've got now, which is stage four. So it's yeah. kind of unfulfilled spiritual journey business number one yeah successful but unhappy owner uh, and then business number four which is where i'm now which is better happy okay so on um so on business number one how long did you have that for five years almost um, almost to the day really yeah. and it was um a gym gym membership business like yeah it? so it was um some people will, will turn their noses when i say this it was a crossfit gym okay um, <laughs> but it was a good crossfit gym so the problem with crossfit is it's not like nando's it's not a it's not a um franchise it's an affiliate so just because you've got the crossfit name you can go in and have very different experiences mm-hmm. ours was very tidy we didn't have people with tops off in the gym but, you know <laughs> it wasn't that kind of image of a crossfit gym it was um very health focused old people young people kids we had people in their 70s and their 80s but it but yeah that was that was the first gym so it was um kind of like a small group personal training yeah medium group personal training so higher than your average gym price you know 150 pound plus memberships okay um but really good quality coaching and atmosphere and community yeah and so you had a team with you as well yeah so we had uh three full-time staff okay and we had two kind of not full-time staff part-timers or partial partial workers whatever term you want to put on it and were they um like for one but like the doers like the trainers the people train like they were training other people in the gym. yeah they're all coaches Co- they're yeah, they're coaches. All, that is the word they're, they're all coaches one i mean it wasn't officially written like this but one was kind of like the facilities manager as well she's now actually got her own gym so she's done and i train at her gym now so oh really I, I wind her up and still pretend that i'm a boss but, uh, <laughs> I'm, but I'm not. and it's funny we have some banter but yeah so uh yeah they're all coaches okay so so in this gym then ultimately you are the one wearing all of the hats i guess as well in terms of finance getting new clients yep. marketing yep. All. yeah not that i not that you understand that at the start you're kind of yeah. just doing it all aren't you you know yeah. you go yeah you, ha- you have to you can read about it in books and i do read a lot of books but you you you, you, you have to go through it to realize it don't you and i think most business owners especially you know when you're in that stage of business that first anywhere between five and ten years i think you don't even know you're doing that no you just like, oh yeah i'm i'm doing you don't even, i didn't even know i kid you not I, I remember i started going to networking meetings and they were talking about leads and i'm like what does that even mean and i'd had a business for like two years a good business <laughs> and I, I don't know what lead means and i was like i remember asking someone what do they mean when they say leads <laughs> they're like when you inquiries and i was like oh <laughs> Never heard. I'd never heard any of this business stuff. There's no business acumen in my family. I'm ex-military. It's probably like the least business thing mm-hmm. you can do. So yeah, I didn't have a clue. Uh, I didn't even know that I was doing marketing. I didn't even know what that meant. Yeah. I just knew I needed to make money. We needed to bring people in. We needed to keep people. Yeah. So that's, oh, and were you coaching as well? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, so you're doing the, everything. The last, yeah, absolutely everything. And doing split shifts. So working first thing in the morning, last thing at night, never getting decent night's sleep because of the way that the hours worked. I, I did get, I did, off, I did um, outsource some things pretty quickly because I was so bad at them. So like the accounts, the bookkeeping, mm-hmm. like I had to outsource that very early. 
Um, but my problem is, and I think a lot of business owners will relate to this, is I can do a little bit of everything quite well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is good <laughs> until it's not good, which is when you're like, well, I, I could get somebody else to do that, but I can do it all right. And then you're like, well, you're doing everything and then you're not enjoying it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was definitely um, doing way too much and that had a big impact on my health, which made me feel like crap about myself because my health is a big kind of value for me. And I was, you know, in a position where really I should be a leader in health. Yes, for sure. So then you feel like a fraud because you're like, well, I'm talking about health, and but I'm not doing it myself. Um, a big impact on my, my relationship. Mm. Um, luckily, my partner's a bit of a saint and very patient. But if it was the other way around, like I don't think I'd have had the patience that she did with me. Uh -huh. But we hardly saw each other. We went on holiday twice in five years. Oh, wow, yeah. Because okay. you justify it to yourself as, an, as a business owner. You know, I'm putting the money back into the business and I'm busy. And you tell yourself this story that I'll... Um, I'll make more time for me next week once I've solved mm. this problem. And then it's like next month. But the problems just replace themselves. But you never fix all the problems. So it's not it's not the problems that are the issue. It's your mindset, isn't it? And you telling yourself that it's all going to go wrong if you step away. And if you and if this kind of constant sense of urgency you create in your mind where you're like, well, there's an issue. I've got to fix that now. And I, don't think, I don't think that really happens anywhere other than business, mm -hmm. other than business ownership. Because in a job... I guess it does happen in jobs because I do a lot of work with managers and leaders now. And like, I think the more senior you become, the more you feel that. Mm -hmm. But with a business, it's your thing. When you're getting a bad review, you see that as a reflection of you. When totally. the customer's complaining, you know, you'll know this. You, 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 um, you internalise it. If oh. a customer complains, which is going to happen, you're going to be like, oh, what have I done wrong? And I am world class at that. <laughs> at, at emotionally attaching every yeah. single thing that goes wrong is like either a reflection on me, everybody's going to hate me, my reputation's gone because one small thing's happened. Yeah, it's um, it's an art for me to keep just like um, putting things into perspective, definitely. Yeah, it's got to be done, hasn't it? And I think it's only in business ownership where you do it to that to that level. Like in a job, maybe you're like, oh, you know, something's gone wrong. Is that me? Am I, am I, am I failing? But in a business, you're responsible for the business. It's your, it's your income, it's your yeah. livelihood. It's your, you tell yourself it's your reputation. But yeah, yeah you, you, the human mind is definitely hardwired to spot the negative, isn't it? Like if you get 99 positive reviews <laughs> and one negative review, you oh, know, so all, you, all you go to bed thinking about is that negative review. By the way, we didn't get loads of negative reviews. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's what your brain looks out for. And it's statistically irrelevant. If you've got 99 people that are loving it and one that's disliking it, well, then it's probably that person's not the right fit for the business. But your, yeah. your brain doesn't work like that. And you can end up taking all this stuff on your shoulders and making yourself miserable about something. Yeah, we do it's really. meant to make you happy. Yeah, yeah. And we do really let our businesses define us, don't we? It's like, you know, it's who we are. It's what we're about. And I think also for me, because... Um, my business is what I used to do prior to my PA. Like I was a PA, I was an, an EA. I guess you were passionate about CrossFit. You were already doing it. I feel like because when you have a business where you are, are, like you know how to do the service, you're in it. I feel like it's so much more attached to, you know, mm. whereas if you'd say bought a business like Cody Sanchez talks about doing la laundromats or whatever, yeah. like that's just like such a detachment, isn't it? But a lot of us start from this place of, well, I know how to do this. I love it. And it just becomes this out of control, like connection to us, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I can't remember who it was talking about that. Um, it's some very successful, um, knowledgeable business kind of coach. And I remember them saying like, one of the best things you can do to develop your business skills is get a business that you've got zero passion for. Yeah, yeah, but totally. exactly what you've just said, because then you're looking to look at it as this non-emotional entity that needs to work yeah. whereas when you're remote when you're like love your thing like you with the with the yeah. PA stuff like you want everything to be perfect and if it's not perfect you're like well i can see how that can be better and yes. i want to fix that so yeah it's it's definitely a pro to be emotionally invested into your business mm. but it's definitely got its challenges as well definitely and um did you see the burnout coming no it's a funny it's an interesting thing i think about burnout a lot because i, f I find it a really interesting concept and I've probably got some unpopular thoughts on it. Um, but for me, it's really fascinating because you know, I've done five years in the army, two tours of Afghanistan mm -hmm. attached, to the, attached to the special forces. So we're like, we're cutting 20 hour days sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they're like three month tours, um, uh, three to six month tours. So it's probably one of like the most demanding, f mentally demanding and, and at times physically kind of draining jobs you can do. After that, when I did my, traveling phase i actually had three months of working on a fishing boat in australia off really? the, yeah off the coast off the south coast so everything's trying to kill you 
Because you like, you literally got great white sharks swimming around. But again, you're doing 20 hours a day sometimes. Like, you don't know what's going on. You don't know if it's the sun coming up or the moon <laughs> coming up. You know, you're out for 10 days at a time. And in every, it just happened that whilst I was doing that job, for every 10 day period you're out at sea, you get three days of good weather, three days of average, and three days of I'm going to die mm-hmm. kind of weather. So, probably that was probably more tiring actually than the army. So, I've done like two, in my opinion, and I'm sure there's definitely harder jobs, but I've done two pretty physically demanding jobs. Yeah. The, if you'd have gone to that version of Mike and talked about burnout, I'd have said, oh, just get on with it. What are you talking about? You know, I'm not, and again, I'm not proud to say that, but sometimes we don't believe in things until we've experienced them. So having a business was, was fascinating because or going through this and having a business, I didn't know it was happening to me. All I knew, or I suppose all I knew was I was getting a bit more and more miserable <laughs> and tired and losing my spark. And that really made me dislike myself because I'm like, oh, I like being the passionate person. I like being the guy that inspires yeah. others and is motivated and you know, dr- driven, but that was just going. And, and, and I, looking back now, it's obvious. Like I know, you know it's obvious. I was it working obvious too much. In I was, yeah. I was, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But I think we all look back at the mistakes we made and go, God, why did I do that? Mm. But if I hadn't been through that, I guess I wouldn't understand burnout at all. But yeah, I didn't know it was happening. I just felt like I was getting more tired, more drained, um, enjoying it, like losing the enjoyment, but then disliking myself for that. Mm-hmm. So no, I didn't. I didn't know it was happening. I just knew something wasn't right. But mm. I was saying to myself, "Is this me? I'm, is this my fault? What am I doing wrong?" And even though the answer was obvious, I was working too much, putting too mm-hmm. much pressure on myself, and um, not doing the basics. I, I I was too blind or too stubborn or too scared to notice that. I think at the time. Okay, and just like just on that, is is there any? Um things that you would like that you suggest to you know managers coaches business owners now like if they're um feeling those things that you've mentioned now um in terms of like you're enjoying it a little bit less just you know the, the things that you mentioned like what would be the first some like okay well we just need to start this or like some triggers to put in place or some um routines or is there like some i think you've like, got i think you've got to be careful and again it's just my opinion if you're like struggling with your your mental health let's say so let's say <clears throat> let's say it's work related and because it's not just business owners you know mm. it's what well, it could be any employee yeah, but i think yeah. it gets bad after this kind of shift to management when the emphasis in your work goes away from how hard can you work and the emphasis in your work goes to what results can you get because that nice. requires a yeah. very different approach to working yeah and that's why a lot of us business owners if we're used to be operators so for you you know if you're if you used to be a pa you know how to be a bloody good pa mm-hmm. and then we're like I'm really good at this, so I can do my own business in this. I did the same. Like I had the, I was at a really good CrossFit gym in Australia. I'm, I could do this. And you think it's easy. And you tell yourself it's easier than it is because you're a good operator. But then you go into it and you're like, well, actually, you realize like a year or two in, me just being a good operator isn't making this business work mm-hmm. as well as it should be. Like I've, I'm not making enough money to pay the tax or... I'm working more hours than I used to and I'm getting paid less. So, so you've got to yeah. like figure that stuff out and basically you have to go for this transition and realise that it's not just about working hard, is it? It's about working smart. So I, I do think you can, I don't think burnout just happens at business owner level, but anywhere where you kind of go from that shift to working hard to having to get results. Mm. I, I think you've got to be careful with trying to fix it with tactics. That's one thing that I think from what we do at Better Happy really resonates with owners and their teams. It's like, you know, like you say, I'm okay. I'm, I'm well, I'm a good example actually, because people will say, Well, go and get fit. Like you're stressed, you burn out, you know, you're not, you're obviously not looking after yourself. Go, go and get fit. Fitness is the ultimate, is the ultimate kind of pill. But there's plenty of depressed bodybuilders and <laughs> there's plenty of depressed sports people and, and football players. And, and, and actually, even though I, I definitely was letting my house slip, I was in pretty good shape at the time of suffering my burnout. So, yes doing certain things like mm-hmm. improving your, your work-life balance and all of this stuff definitely going to have a positive correlation but you've got to get to the you've got to get to the root cause of the problem yeah and most of the time that's your mind isn't it yeah so for me my problem was i was putting way too much pressure on myself and if i really dug down into it it's probably for a lack of confidence to to step away to to believe that it's all going to work without me to believe that i was worthy to i, I think i had this belief that i didn't deserve to make the money so I always, this is a, this is a big thing I went through. Like I, I used to hate asking people for money, even though like we were like transforming. Clients. Yeah. I hated it. I don't mind now. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. mean, I still don't love it. I still don't like, but I, I don't really, I'm not, I, I don't really, it doesn't really bother me anymore. It is interesting. But when I started, I was like, I hate asking people for money. 
and, and, and like PT, so like our members, like I, I, I could avoid this because my um, Lisa, the girl that's got her own business now, she didn't care. She's really good. So like she'd do all the sales. Like I, I managed to hide because she could just do all the sales. She had an amazing conversion rate because she believed in what we did. So did I. I believed in what we did. I just didn't like charging money. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so she was really good at that. And um, I think uh, you- there's... I used to have PT clients. So so we'd have people come in for PT yeah. and they, that wasn't a pre-packaged thing that I could put through Lisa. So I had to charge for that. And I remember I'd really like stress about it and put it off. And I remember one of, I'm still friends with him now. He's great. He's a great business lad actually. And then he was one of my clients and he used to say, why, why haven't you put your invoice in? Why, why are you dragging this out? Because I just, I had this fear around money. I don't think I believed I deserved it. It is weird, isn't it? Yeah. And do you, I think you've hit the nail on the head that it's a money mindset issue of what we either believe we're worth or can charge or i know so many business owners with that like i've had it it's it's really or people taking a long time to pay invoices and not really going well i'm going to stop what we're doing or just having that um yeah just believing in the value of what you do have your have your prices changed a lot from like because you started really young, right, in business. You started in 2008, it was, yeah. How old were you? So I was like 26. So that's really young to to, to start a business. So how, so how long has that been going? So 2016 years this year was so, our anniversary. Wow. So that's well, a massive achievement. So are you going to ask me about, did we put, have we put our prices up? Just how have you... How, there is a story to that. Yeah, because obviously like your prices would have gone up just to inflation anyway. But have you has your pricing structure and methodology changed a lot over that time? Um, no. Well, you say like, did it go up by inflation? We had a really interesting, sad conversation earlier this year in that. So um, we've got a couple of services in the business. Um, and our call service, our follow-up service, yeah, we'd just done like the 2%, the 3%. The PA support, which is our most expensive, mm-hmm. expensive is the wrong word, sorry. Um, it's the it's the product that... Premium. It's the premium product. Yeah, it's definitely not expensive. <laughs> it's the premium product, but it's like the, it's not, you know, we, you can start with our other services at a much lower rate. This is like a bigger buy-in, yep. basically. Um, and we were having a conversation this year around as we were managing budgets and we needed to put our price prices up and when I start I was like do you know what I don't think we've done this for a long time when I started to look back through our sales information of like the stuff we'd been sending out the prices we were charging at the beginning of this year were exactly the same prices that we were charging in 2014 Mike yeah. like, this is 10 10 years we've had the same pricing and we've never put it up by two percent inflation and then and so I had a very um, interesting, also like a bit challenging conversation because I was pushing back on my leadership team about, well, you know, are we sure that's the right thing to do now? You know, it's all like all of this stuff was in my head yeah. and we did put our prices up this summer. Um, no, nobody left yeah. because of it, like nobody at all. Um, but that was, that was down to me. That was down to my mindset in the business and ultimately holding my team back, holding my business back but yeah we hadn't done it and i was still i was still having the convert like i was still questioning it was it the right thing to do this year yeah and i think that's so common like i think there's so many business owners that will listen to you well i'm doing it i'm because i was at the same situation right and, res- and resonating with yeah that's me and that's why I like one of the systems i got in that book is about like the, the four different relationships within a business mm-hmm. the, you know you've got the owner if it's a small business or a board, if it's a bigger, but you've got the owner, you've got the employees, you've got the customers, and then you've got the business or the bank, mm-hmm. or the bank account. And and the business has got to work for all four of them, hasn't it? Otherwise, it's it's not a win-win and it's not going to stand the test of time. And I think so many business owners screw over themselves and their teams yeah. to look after their customers. Well, from the perception that they're looking after. Well, yeah, it's too a cheap. perception, isn't yeah. it? Because we, it's human nature, isn't it, to not be to doubt ourselves otherwise we'd all be arrogant so mm-hmm. so it's human nature to doubt yourselves and to and to not be arrogant because when we were hunter gatherers survival was about fitting in with our little tribe and if we didn't fit in with that tribe if we got kicked out by being an idiot or being too cocky or whatever it might be we were going to die so we've still got these thought processes in our brain that are constantly making us doubt ourselves and think oh am i worth that money is it all going to go yeah. wrong and, it, and our brains also want to talk us out of change because they they when we were hunter gatherers which was 95 percent of our time on this planet 
I think we, I think most of us don't realize that by the way, that, you know, we've got these brains that have on these minds that have been adapting for, for, I don't know, maybe 300,000 years. We don't know exactly, but for like up until 10,000 years ago, we were hunter gatherers. Mm -hmm. So for 95% of the time we've been alive, our brains have been in survival mode. Uh and, And one of the other things that they learned to do was, or our minds learned to do was avoid change unless it was absolutely necessary. And the way, because it was dangerous, you know, so if you, if you've got a proven route that you walk each day to forage your berries, your brain's going to do anything it can to talk you out of changing that route because it might be that going the other route is where there's a family of saber-toothed tigers or whatever it might be. So when you've got change, the brain learned to like scare you out of doing that, mm. create anxiety to keep you safe, to keep you alive. So in the modern world, when you're thinking about changing, like perhaps I should put my prices up so that we can pay everybody what they deserve to be paid and deliver a better service so it's better for the customers as well. Logically, we're like, well, yeah. This is why it's easier to solve other people's problems. Yeah. Because I, I, I could say to Emma, well, just put your prices up. Yeah. It's an obvious one, isn't it? And you would say to Mike, if you know, Mike with the gym, you'd say like, well, just put your prices up. It's a no brainer. Like, most of your customers aren't going to leave. You, you're better than all the other gyms that are charging that same price anyway. That's a no brainer. Yeah. But emotionally, you've got this, this 90, you know, this 100,000 years or however long plus of conditioning that's saying, Oh, you do that and everyone's going to leave. Mm. And it's ridiculous. Like, and sometimes it's subconscious, but you don't actually go for that thought process. You just get the, the stress and anxiety of that thought process. So you don't hear it. You don't like hear your brain going, oh, everything's going to go, go wrong. But there is this messaging going, all your customers are going to leave. You, you, you're going to get called exploitative. You're going to look like yep. you're greedy. You're going, to, it's all, you're going to look like a money grabbing person, all of this stuff. And then you resist this change, but it ends up with everybody losing because if you don't charge enough, the business goes, doesn't it? Eventually. Yeah, totally, totally. So, um, so just going a tiny bit forward then in terms of so the burnout phase, COVID. You did you say you had some coaching as well? It's in terms of yeah. like what was next for you. What, well, what, I've what spent. The right I, to do? I, I don't know how much money I've spent on coaching since Snap. I started business. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about this and businessing. I've just created a new word. Um, I think I must have spent over a hundred thousand pounds on coaching. Yeah, and programs and yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. So I had. I, I realized probably and I know you, I know you're big for this as well because I follow your social media and you're like it amazes me how many different people you're learning from and supporting like you're always I know you do your daily fire things at yeah, the right yeah, name, yeah. and then you go to all these different groups and you're just like constantly out there learning and supporting and mm-hmm. you're, you're you're a bit of a pro at that um and I resonate with that but I'm not as good as you but <laughs> yeah I've always had coaching programs or I I've, I learned pretty early on that I you know there's a lot I don't know mm-hmm. and I need to learn this from, yeah, from yeah. other people so yeah I, had a, I actually had a coach at the time of COVID kicking in who was a CrossFit coach oh, right. in regard, a CrossFit business coach so right. he was like helping people with a certain type of business model and he actually said to me he's like I don't think you should carry the gym on which I really respected because it meant that his coaching money was going to go <laughs> but he was like I think you're your passions are aligned elsewhere. I was doing some corporate work already. Oh, right. Um, oh, right. Okay. With like fitness workshops. Yeah. With, with health and, um, and uh, it didn't, yeah, it was mainly with health. So I, one of my, one of the members at my gym had an events company and he was getting a lot of requests for um, more health and movement based events right and he asked me if i'd do one i'm like yeah i don't mind i've been in the army I'd, i'm used to being on stage and standing up and talking in front of big audiences i'm like yeah brilliant and it was quite nice money as well right and it was a bigger audience and it was a wider reach so it's really aligned to my passions so i was like oh oh i really enjoy this it's exciting and it's turned into obviously today it's turned into a whole thing because we realized that just by going in and talking about you know how to fix your posture we were addressing a symptom but most businesses the reason the staff are sick and the owners are sick is because the culture's wrong because we're not dealing with the mind stuff. Mm-hmm. So, oh, sorry, I keep sidelining your, um, I keep uh, no, not railroading your, your train of thought. So, yeah, I did have a coach and then, yeah, he kind of encouraged me to close it. Okay. So, we just chat a bit, a bit about you creating Better Happy. Yeah. Um, so, you have a self model mm-hmm. in it, which which is what you use with all of your clients and their managers, team leaders. Yep. Um, and the self model is S E L P H, isn't yep. it? Not Ten S-E-L-P-H. points, well done. Thanks. <laughs> See, you're always, you're always learning, always done, remembering. Done my research <laughs> on this fire. Um, yeah, I mean, I would love you to dive into. Obviously, I think we've learned why you started Better Happy because you were passionate about. I guess business owners not going through the same thing as you, but then extending that to the teams as well. Yeah, I think uh, we you, you mentioned something interesting before. You like about an analogy that that somebody said to you about kind of 
a lot of what you do is for you five years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I've done some training with Russ Brunson and he kind of talks about that. He's like, build the solution you needed five years ago. So actually Better Happy was a bit of an accidental design, really. I was like, well, why did I get burnt out? I think very systematically. So I was like, well, why did I get burnt out? What led to that? And what did I need to stop me? What do I need to stop me from doing that again? Because I wanted, I got, after the gym, I got stuck between a rock and a hard place, really, because part of me went through the, shall I just get a job? Mm -hmm. Which I think every business owner on the planet goes through. Yeah, at least, definitely. At least, at least once a month. Yeah. <laughs> but, but maybe more. <laughs> so so sh sh shall I get a job? But I, kn I knew that in the short term, I'd like that because I'd get a bit of money in my bank. I wouldn't have to worry um, about all the stresses of business. Mm -hmm. and, um, you can give switch me, off it in the evening. Switch and, off, yeah. yeah and it'd give me a bit of comfort. But I knew that within six months that would make me miserable because it's not what my passion is. Uh, so the other option was go back into business, but I'm like, but I don't want to do that to myself again. You know, I don't want to put Laura through that. I don't want to um, go back through putting myself in that situation where I put way too much pressure on myself and don't enjoy it. Yeah. So like, what do I do? And I was like, well, the answer's obvious, isn't it? I need to figure out how to have a business and enjoy the process and stay healthy and have a, and have a life at the same time. So I started building the things that I needed to um, stop me doing that again. Because I, kn I know that it wasn't just a logical understanding that was going to help me. So I know that I, I like to work too much because I'm passionate about what I do. And I know that just knowing that isn't going to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody listening to this is going to go, oh yeah, I work, I work too much and that's not good for me. So I'm going to stop doing it. It's not how it works. You know, mm -hmm. you, you'll know that as well. Yeah. So I was like, well, I need a system. So I started building like simple systems that I needed. So like a cadence calendar, which we'd still use to this day mm -hmm. right, in businesses. And it's like, it's, it's a template. It's a, it's a table on a page and it like changes people's lives because it works. A cadence of the things that happen in the business. Like no, so the cadence calendar came from the realization that um, when we work too much, our, our, our go-to, especially business owners and like leaders and managers, our go-to ten tends to be what we need better time management. And the problem is, is we love working, right? And if things are going wrong... <laughs> We're jumping in. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, getting, we're not sticking to that time management thing that we've that we've planned. Right, and I'm not saying they're not good things to have. They are, but but when things go wrong or there's a thing that needs addressing or a bit stressed, like all that's getting thrown out the window because we want to solve the problem and actually we like doing that. So why try and change that about ourselves? So I thought, well, what's better than that is accept that you're probably going to work too much and that's okay, but have like minimum non-negotiables that you stick to for twelve weeks because that'll help you build habits. So instead of going. I will only work these set hours, nothing's changing, have some non-negotiable. So we, and we limit it to two, so two daily, two weekly, two monthly, and then the option of doing something quarterly. But you've got to think about every 12 weeks. Okay, what do I need to have as non-negotiables in my life over the next 12 weeks to not let my tendency to overwork okay. make me miserable? Nice. So for, for Laura and I, because um, we do it together because we're sad. Uh, so <laughs> one thing that we did, and now I don't even have to write down, is we were like, well, let's, we both like to work and if things are going wrong, we'll work in the evenings and we don't feel bad about that. But let's say that we have to have one day night a week. So mm -hmm. that's it. That's a non-negotiable. So then we don't feel guilty about working on a Monday night because we know on Thursday night, we turn the computers off, we don't work and we go out. So that's a non-negotiable that, it, so then it changes that narrative instead of just going, you can't work after five. And then sometimes you want to work after five and you feel guilty about it, even though you, you want to do it. Yeah. It changes that narrative to, well, I can work after five as long as, we go and have our date night on a yeah, Thursday yeah. and then you make that habit and then you start, but what happens is, is your brain starts to realize, actually I can still get really good results whilst prioritizing these things. So they just build and build and build. So actually now very rarely do either of us, either of us work after five mm -hmm. because we just built habits in, but you change that every 12 weeks. Okay. So we started building tools like that. I started sharing them on the internet and it re I realized that it wasn't just business owners that wanted this, it was managers and leaders. Um, so it just, that started to formulate the business really. And you work it with some big, corporates as well travel lodge yeah yeah you know, we, we develop a the south model travel lodge got like their own version of it that we've done through consulting with them so they've got the limitless model so okay. and that all of their level three which is their managers in the hq side of the business all of them get to go through that so it's wow. like bespoke to travel lodge but it's all about health um balancing your time with things like cadence calendars mm -hmm. um mindset yeah so can you Talk us a little bit through the self model and the principles that the uh, that Better Happy are based on, and how you help yeah. in your clients. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so it's got five steps, and it's S E L P H, which can also spell helps, which is much easier to remember. <laughs> but um, I like putting health at the end, so that's okay. why I changed it to self. And so I much prefer the, the the order of self. So, and this works not just 
what I find fascinating about this model is it doesn't just work for business, it works for a team and it works for an individual as well. So you can just translate it across. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a strategy first. Right? If you any anything in life that isn't comfort is effort. You know, like you're you're doing these podcasts now and I know like you're super passionate about them and but but the reason that you're doing them is because you're passionate and you can see how it's going to work for you and yeah. for business. But if you if you weren't clear on that, so you've got strategy, whether you've written it down or not, you've got a bit of a strategy around it. You're like, well, I'm really passionate about helping business owners focus and actually enjoy their business. I really like putting content out. I really like inspiring people. So I think a podcast would be a good idea. But it's effort, right? And I've actually, I remember you saying when you did your first episode and I've seen your stuff, you know, it's, it's been a long time coming yeah. because you're busy. You're like, yeah, you've got to, yeah, yeah. So you've got to try and fit this new thing into your life. And you know that that new thing is going to make you happier or bring, bring better results or whatever it might be. But it's hard. Is, is the truth because every day we just want to settle into our routine it's had these brains of ours again so you have to have a strategy at the start whether it's in detail or not is relevant you've got to have some kind of strategy i say with the owners you, you should really have three types of strategy for your business so you've got to think how's your business going to fulfill you how's it going to pay you like what money do you want from it and then what's the business strategy for that but the, that should come last like the business strategy should, should fulfill the owner's fulfillment and finances yeah so you've got to have a strategy and that changes over time because life goes in levels with a business or a team, you then need to have engagement. That's the E. So, okay, I've got a strategy and I can run this strategy probably quite far on my own, but I'm going to get to a point where I need a team. Mm. So then I need to create a culture where I've got a team of the right people that want to work hard for me. And we can't just rely on money for that anymore. And we'll talk about that in the book and like, yeah. those hierarchy needs. But people used to work to get out of poverty till very recently, really. And there was limited jobs. So you, you, if you just pay people a minimum acceptable wage, you'd always have a team. Mm -hmm. today people have got a choice of jobs they yeah. um they they aren't working to escape poverty they're working to obviously we still need to pay bills and put food on the table but people are working because they want to and because it fulfills things in them mm -hmm. so we've got to have a different strategy to how we engage people and if you get that right by the way it's it's actually a win-win because businesses need more creativity and, and innovation businesses are more service-based now so you can't just have moody mike in the in the warehouse packing boxes you know it doesn't matter if he's moody there because he's just doing us but now like you've got service-based business or you need innovation or creativity so if your staff aren't happy your business customers aren't getting a great yeah. experience so yeah. so we've got to have a new strategy for how we engage people and once you see that in the right way it's actually a win-win um leadership so you, whether that's just you the owner or your leadership team you've got to have strong leadership and i think what most of us think is is that well, we're good at what we do and we'll be able to naturally create a good leadership team. But what happens is owners think very differently to teams, even oh the leadership gosh. teams. And then we think, this is how, this is generally that I was with a business yesterday, a really good client of ours, and with his leadership team and the owner. And I always have the same conversation. I'm like, the problem is, is you think your leadership team are you and they're not, right? So business owners like, love new ideas, right? We get really excited for them and we'll just, and we're, and we're, we're just, scatty and we'll go for it you know new thing we just like going after it generally speaking employees are different even mm -hmm. if they're in your leadership team they like a bit of safety a bit of security they like to think things through they like a plan and they're also worried about getting stuff wrong as we are yeah so what happens a lot of times is a leadership team is like the owner or the leader thinks well if i just share this great idea then they'll just run with it because that's what i would do but what happens is you go back to them three months later and you're like well have you done that thing and they're like no you know, well, why not? And it's not because they're bad people, but it's because you didn't hold them accountable because you didn't think you needed to because you thought they'd be like you. Um, so you didn't put systems and measures in place and they're worried about getting it wrong. So if they can avoid it yeah. and just go back to their daily routine, they will. So we tend to think, oh, everyone's just going to be a great natural leadership team. But if we don't put systems and stuff in place, they won't be. Oh my gosh. Honestly, my, I've had the rudest awakening on this this week. <laughs> Literally about three or four weeks ago, I went into our weekly Monday meeting and I said X, Y, and Z. And I was like, actually, I think we need to start doing this, stop doing that, blah, blah. And I said it from a perspective of, I've just thought of this, but I think this is what we need to start doing. And then yesterday, uh, not yesterday, Monday, Tuesday, whenever it was, I had um, a meeting with the same people and the mood was a bit low and I was like what's going on and and they were like well a bit we feel a bit like we don't know what's going on you know and the other and they literally said the other week you came to this meeting with this idea and we were like right okay that's new we haven't heard about that before so what's happening there and then it wasn't mentioned again since and then and I in my head I think I'm coming because my PA needs ideas which it does but clearly 
me just vomiting ideas on a leadership team without actual forethought and strategy because I just like you've exactly said I just think everyone's like me I'm gonna go oh yeah that's great okay let's do this and that and yeah. I am also aware that I will be a bad influence in that I can change what they're working on when actually let's just get this one thing done yeah and now I'm like well this is also a really great idea but and, and my my uh, definitely like default position is oh we can do both at the same time yeah. or we can do another one at the same time let's just do it all yeah. because I yeah and um, that was like a real a rude awakening for me this week and they said that to me what was your key what do you think your key <laughs> takeaway from that was well um I'd, i was speaking to a friend about it on wednesday a mutual friend will and he was like actually number one is that that's a massive breakthrough at least now like like the conversation's been had and it was obviously a a um uh like a vulnerable like a at least it was like a straightforward conversation to, that they actually said to me. Which is but, good. But they're, that they're happy to have that Yeah, that we do feel a bit like this because you're coming up with all of this stuff. So um, number one, which I am very pleased about this week, it does feel like a massive breakthrough. And two, I've just got a bit of time to reflect on that to go, actually, um, I think I've just been like barnstorming through a bit with new stuff, with new stuff. And I've probably done less of the... Um, original sharing of like the strategy of like actually guys let's sit together and talk yeah. and go is this a good idea what do we think about that rather than just flying in dropping so, it and flying out again so so something that's interesting with the self strategy is is like so you've got strategy engagement leadership then it goes on to performance which is how we breaking down what we're focusing on into manageable chunks and then the final piece is health so why are we looking after ourselves so we can keep fulfilling this strategy long term business owners can do all of that on their own and they do so you, when you started MyPA, you'd have had, whether it was written down in a document or not, you'd have had an idea in your head of some kind of strategy, right? Even if it was woolly as, there was some kind of strategy there. You would have created an environment where you were happy to work in. Yeah, you would have, you, you would have communicated that to yourself internally. So, so you are the leadership team. You'd have focused on a few things at a time. So you, that's your performance piece. And maybe you did look after your health. Maybe you didn't. I assume you did because you're in good shape and mm -hmm. you're still here today. Now, what happens is, is... a and we talk about this in the second chapter, business goes through levels and you get to a point in business and I, I, I said level one startup. So that's where Emma can do everything on her own or Mike can do everything on his own and it works. And actually you quite like it and you don't even care about how much money you make because at the start, because you're like, oh, my own boss, I'm making this work. And it's fun and yeah. it's energizing, yeah. isn't it? And but that's yeah. got a shelf life because at some point you working all the hours that God sends without getting paid much money doesn't yeah. d stops being cool and your partner stops supporting you as well <laughs> so, <laughs> so, then, so then you get to a bit where you're like okay i'm making some momentum so then you get to what i call like the success phase which is not you've made it but it's like you've got customers um you, you, you found a, a you found a kind of gap in the market where people like you and you, you can create more customers you're building a bit of a team so that's the success phase um but it's still reliant on you so you're still enjoying it, but you still like that because it's like, I'm leading this. My team love me. The customers love yeah. me. Like I am the leader of this, of this um, cool journey. But that stage moves into the slog phase. And it moves into the slog phase when you, everything being reliant on you and the team looking up to you and the customers looking up to you stops being cool, mm -hmm. which will happen eventually. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, and that's just normal because I think life and business go through levels. So that's, that's normal. And the problem is, is that if you don't, if you don't, adapt your strategy and how you're working you're going to stay stuck in that slog phase mm. because what your business needs once you get to the, once you get to the bit where it's like oh, i don't want it all to be relying on me anymore or you've got a big team because once you've got a big team i know you've got quite a big team now it can't all be relying on you because yeah. you can emma can only be in so many places at once then you've got to start to move into what we call level three which is the systems phase and that's and when we say systems we're like for your business it's like systemizing emma right it's like all that stuff you, we, you within emma is the code to make this thing work because you've got it to where it is but you've got that as far as it can go being stuck in emma uh -huh. so like you just said your, your strategy like yeah. you've now got to figure out how do i get this out of my head and onto a document that my team can understand in a nice concise manner mm. so and business owners don't like doing that because <laughs> we're like well it's all in my head i don't know how to do that yeah um so you've got to start codifying yourself and once you get to that phase of business where you're like Phew, a bit fed up of it all being reliant on me and or I'm struggling to leverage my team or they don't understand what's in my head and it's just you just got to get good at systemizing and if you're not good at it that's where like I and this isn't me trying to sell my services to Emma by the way but but <laughs> but if you but if you when you get to that bit if you're no good at it and you crap at crap at doing that like just like you guys say to people about um admin you know, if you hate doing admin 
well, outsource it or get somebody in your team like, and yeah. we can provide that service. But if you hate systemizing, it's just not working for you, find somebody that can help you do that because it's hard, it is hard to do it yourself. It's hard to think about your own strategy and make it simple because you're too emotionally connected to it. Whereas like somebody else could go, so you want to be this, this and this and you want to, and, and then help you communicate that to your team in a way that they actually can process and act on mm. as opposed to feeling overwhelmed by yeah, definitely. Um, and I know we don't have loads of time left, but there's something I really want to touch on with you because one of our biggest shocks at my PA, especially from, because like COVID was a real blow up time for us. Like it broke down virtual work and everybody was at home. So they got the virtual experience. They understood they could work with somebody virtually. So we grew a lot. COVID did um, better for you than it did for my gym. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it, was, it was, I think it was either brilliant for a business yeah, owner yeah, or yeah, terrible, yeah. wasn't it? Um, but like at the beginning of, before COVID happened, there was like 12 of us a year later, there was 20 of us there's now like uh, 35 of us and the biggest th shock that i mean daniel Priestley talks about it, like being in the desert and yeah. you're like too small you're not you're not small you're not big you're in yeah. this weird place yeah. in the middle but the biggest shock i had was the culture aspect of a business and we've been from like 2022 to now it's been a roller coaster of understanding how you manage and maintain all of that secret sauce that my pa had when there was 10 of us sat around a big big desk knowing each other intimately, going out for drinks, yep. do you know what I mean? And yep. then and then you start to bring people into the business and all of a sudden I realised, probably like end of 21, you no longer realise if everybody's happy. Mm. And and Daniel Priestley talks about, you know, people start arguing with each other, sleeping with each other. All these things happen that you never, ever imagined that can yeah. come up. Um, and so I think it was, I, I know you mentioned it in the book, and when I realised that culture can be and does have to be systemized to yeah. an extent and some people hate that some people are like culture by design that's yeah right. so i just want to delve into that a bit because um i mean we use friday pulse which i know you yeah. mentioned in the book and it's the most fantastic piece of software i mean i've i've recommended it to people with less than 10 members of the team it's still great i feel like whatever yeah. your size you're at and that's one thing we use as a system to to get an understanding but yeah, it would just be good to delve into a bit more because I feel like systemizing culture sounds wrong. It yeah. sounds like anti anti what culture should be about. But yeah. like, any like t strategies on how you do start to do that? Because because I was very aware that as I spent more time out of the business working on the things I had to work on, then or like how does the Emma secret sauce get into and throughout the business? Yeah, I, my opinion is you've got to codify Emma. Yeah, and I think I think business owners can can get this wrong here because they can think. We need to let the culture evolve naturally. And I think modern politics pushes a message like that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it is wrong, but I don't think it's right. So you've got a secret source that you've proven, right? And the, and the problem is, is that it relies on you being there because your values are coming out of you. Mm -hmm. So so I was thinking about what are Emma's values? Like I've thought about that before because I like because we do this with businesses and teams. I'm like, what are the values here? And like, I know for you, and I know this because I've worked with your team as well, like, this unwavering support, unwavering positivity. Like, I, yeah. I, from the, the version of Emma that I see, which I know, you know, because I see a lot of your social media, probably isn't how you feel all the time, but you're always positive. Yeah. You're always learning, you're always getting better, and you're super supportive of people. So straight away, it's like, well, if anybody comes into your culture that isn't like that, they're not going to be a good fit. And if you said, oh, let's just let the culture evolve itself you're going to end up people that aren't like that then you're going to be annoyed the business is going to change so i think you should be stubborn and be like this is what this is what i'm proud of this is what i want to see and i think when you give people the guide a rough guidance around what your culture should be they can become their own people within that i think you've got to be careful that you don't just let it become itself so you've got to have a, a vision and a mission mm -hmm. so, and it doesn't it should be on one page right and that's like why do we exist what problem are we trying what change are we trying to create in the world your mission's kind of like what makes us unique. And I I try to codify it down into three things. So what's the three things that we do really well that a my PA competitor couldn't do all three of or doesn't do all three of? So we're better happy. Like we talk about leadership and management, but we also really deep, deep dive deep into health. So there's other businesses that are great at leadership. There's other businesses that are great at management. There's very few that are great at leadership, management, and health. So that yeah. gives us a, a really good USP. Um, so you've got to have your you've got to have that and then you and then you've got to have your values. Like, and you should have three to five values, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, I think with three to five values written down or behaviors, whatever you want to call them, a vision and a mission and having a system where you hold people accountable to that. So every quarter is the process we teach where you do a PDP, personal development plan with somebody. You, you invest into them, you learn about what they want, but you also talk about what the business wants because it's a relationship, right? It's like engagement is 
an employee will go above and beyond for your business if they feel like you'll go above and beyond for them. Yeah. Or if you feel, if they feel like you care about them and their growth, they'll care about your business and your growth. But obviously there's two things there. There's what the employee wants and what the business wants. And you can't sacrifice what the business wants and business needs for the employee. Mm-hmm. It needs to be a middle point. And I think with modern culture and modern messaging and modern politics, you fall into this trap where you're like, I've got to keep everybody happy. It's terrible if I fire somebody, you know, it's a failing. No, it's not. Like, if they're not the right culture fit, get rid of them. Yeah. If you, you know, people, and, and your culture's not got to be nice. Yeah. Culture's got to be right. So yeah. if you, there might be another version of Emma out there with her own business who's got a PA business and, and their thing is we will do anything for you at a second drop, even if it's on a Sunday. And the staff are expected to work six days a week. They get paid loads of money. They charge really high prices, but like anything that happens, they have to respond yeah. to it. And it's a high stress culture but they get paid loads of money for it and go on big parties. That's not wrong. I wouldn't want to work there. I don't mm, think you would. No. But but that's what the culture is. And you just got to be clear on that and codify it. And the key to codifying it is your vision, your mission, and your values. And I think that's the bare minimum and holding people accountable to that. Yeah. And um, just I do highly recommend the book because you do, that particular chapter as well really spoke to me, just having it simply laid out like the vision and yeah. the mission. Because yeah. um, I, I just realised one of my, it's been a big learning for me over the past few years, but because I've had my business for so long, you almost feel like, well, I felt like that by osmosis or everything that's gone before of how Emma operates, how Emma wants my, to be, my PA to be, will just like, you know, seep into yeah. everybody and all of these new people that are joining the business. Yeah, and um, the problem is, is like your business has been able to stay in the culture you want it to be until you maybe, well, I'm not saying it's not, but but it relatively easily until you got to 30 or whatever, because you're there mm-hmm. and you are the culture. Like it is a code of Emma. So when you're able to be everywhere, that culture gets maintained by your presence. Now, at some point, either because you don't want to be there as much or the team gets so big, you can't be everywhere. Then it's like, you you wish it would just carry on being exactly what it needs to be because that's what it's always been but it can't because you can't be everywhere so now you've got to give everybody the right systems and structure so that they know how to maintain that culture and be and be their own people Mm -hmm. and without it written down in a nice simple format and people being held accountable to it it doesn't work one of the most impactful things we do with teams is go quarterly check on your team score them on the behaviors or the values of the business because then all of a sudden it's a thing everyone talks about that's awesome. Yeah, you're like, well, these are the yeah. four or five values that we hold high at my PA. Yeah. This is how you've done on them over the last three months. How do you, what do you think? So this one you've absolutely embodied. This one I think you could have done better on um, because, you know, you did that thing in that meeting and you didn't follow through on that project and that's, mm. you know, whatever it might be. And then they're like, okay, cool. And then, but then instead of like giving them a talent off, you're like, what do we need to work on to make that better next yeah. quarter? And if they don't like that, they're going to self-remove. <laughs> they're like, I don't want to do that. You're like, well, then yeah. you're in the wrong business. Yeah, totally. We uh, we we did our values in March this year. We've had like four or five iterations of our values now. Yeah. And as the business has grown and progressed, we felt like we needed to go deeper into what they are. Um, but so we did that in March. We had a, like a launch internally, but um, we are not doing that. We are not every quarter reflecting back on the values. Like we've got some other stuff going on where we we celebrate each other based on demonstrating a value, but the actual like reflecting back on each of them individually we don't do so that's a takeaway for me today yeah and i guess one of your challenges is going to be because you're so nice and supportive which is a key part of your culture i think from what i've seen from the outside that makes the holding people accountable and having the difficult conversation not so nice well not so easy because it's not what we want to do right but <laughs> like somebody's told you that <laughs> like you, no, you're no, told, no, no. you fit the nail on the head <laughs> it's, like, it's not very natural yeah. for us to, it's, it's natural for us to want to be nice yeah and yeah. to avoid conflict again yeah. you want to gather a brain like conflict could lead to death yeah so you're like i just i just wish everyone would just do it right and life would be easier if everyone for was, sure that's not how it works so yeah. so like for you to for, for you to main you, you've got to protect a culture because people to live in line with your values, whether it's in your personal life or your business, you're going to have to have difficult conversations because people, it's just, it's not people being bad people. They'll just start to take liberties. Mm-hmm. And if they know they can get away with it, they will. So like, you've got to be a little bit like, this is the culture. And if you're not willing to do that, then that needs to be called out. Otherwise it will start to crumble yeah. away. And um, yeah, you've, it's one of the, I think you've got to get into the mind of the greater good. It's like, if I want this business to stand the test of time, to be an enjoyable place to work, to attract the right people, to keep giving the right service to the customers, we've got to protect that culture. Yeah. And that's going to mean occasionally having conversations with people that makes them a little bit upset. And difficult. But yeah. That's one of the... It's just, it's part of the game we've decided <laughs> to play, isn't it? Or yeah, but, <laughs> but you want to get anywhere in life, I think. Yeah. Are we out of time or are we going on? Uh, no, well, I'm going to wrap up, Charlie. Okay. But yeah. I think, 
to get, it's such a massive jumping point in life to go from being an operator to being a business owner or a, ma- or, or a manager. Yeah. And even though I think it's a bigger jump to go to business owner, even a manager is a massive jump because lots of managers, I do a lot of work with managers and actually the correlations between managers and business owners are quite similar. Yeah. And it's because before you're in a leadership position, you can just do your job and you can avoid conflict. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. that's a big thing that most of it, you know, you're in, in a junior role, you don't have to call somebody out if they're being a, an idiot. Like yeah. that's the manager's job. That's yeah. why I get paid more. But then you get there and you're not, oh, I've got to have that conversation now. That person's turning up late and I'd rather not have an argument with them. So yeah. I just won't say anything. And if you don't develop that confidence to have that conflict, you're going to get walked all over in a leadership role. Mm-hmm. So it's a big jump. But once you once you go through it, you realise, oh, it's not that bad. Yeah. It's like nothing, nothing that terrible happens if I have a difficult conversation with someone. But all of your human emotion and your hundreds of thousands of years in condition is telling you not to it's do it. It's against it, totally. Mike, thank you so much for today. Thank I thought there's been so on. much good stuff in there. Uh, just the, the different stages that business owners go through and imp- implementable stuff. The book, um, The Happy Business Revolution, is fantastic. I highly mm-hmm. recommend it for any size that you're at because it's, it's a good to like prep ahead. And also, I know that you've got some f- um, resources that people can use. Just chat us through what those are. Yeah, we've got a light course Um of the South method, which is like really easy. Um, it's broken down so that you can do it in 30 minute learning sessions and it's like seven modules. So you, but I, we tell you at the start of it, do it over seven to 10 weeks mm-hmm. um, to start implementing this stuff into your business. And um, we'll put a discount link. So it's half price on, oh, amazing. we'll give it in the show notes. Yeah, so we'll yeah, yeah, like definitely. A My, we'll put a MyPA link. So that's normally 200 quid, but we'll put that on for 99 with a, with a link to anybody that's stuck stuck with us for this whole episode I did, <laughs> I, did listen, I did listen to your previous episodes and i thought i really hope i don't talk too much and i want to make sure that emma's and now we've run over, over. <laughs> and, I've, and i've run it over so i do apologize and if, for decent um, editing. <laughs> yeah, no not at all um and where can people find you uh, LinkedIn's probably the best. Yeah. So MikeJones.live is my personal site. So that, that links to all the businesses um, and that'll link to LinkedIn as well. But Mike, oh, thanks mum and dad for giving me the world's most common name. So <laughs> search Mike Jones, I'm going to find me or a, a, an American rapper. I did find teeth. an American rapper yeah, yeah. when I first Googled it. That was yeah. me before I started myself. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. <laughs>